that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. So lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Energy Week with George Harvey and the famous Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. <laughs> world traveler, philosopher, poet, and adventurer. <laughs> or at least a couple of the above. Every day I get up um, too early and uh, spend several hours looking over the, um, the news that relates to energy and climate change and um, put together each, each article I find that, that um, interests me, I put together a 50 word or 55 word synopsis and uh, put, give it a link to its, the original and I package 10 to 15 of these together every day and put them up, up at my blog which is geoharvey.com G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y goes up every day and uh, every week Tom and I get together on a Thursday morning and go through the, the most interesting materials from that blog the best of the blog the best of the blog so everybody can find out what is going on in the world um, in a somewhat biased approach to uh, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> some of these articles are really quite interesting. Yeah, some of them are. Some of them are quite long. And uh, we could spend sometimes the whole show on just one of them. Yeah. So if you see something particularly interesting, look at George's blog and pull it up and uh, read it. You can go to the blog and just scroll down, but the blog has a uh, calendar. We try to keep our, our viewers abreast of the date that these things appear on. The date is usually the day after it appeared in the news or on in publication. And uh, so you can go and click on the date on the calendar and um, read more on any one of these. I'll try to alert you to some that I find interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we should start into that. We've got yeah, a picture, got a here, picture coming up here of of people harvesting. Let's start with the picture. And this is from IFL Science. This is on August third. This appeared at the and blog. And it is called "Climate Change Is Draining the Protein Out of Staple Crops." This is kind of bad. Um, this is good. No, it's not. A study led by Harvard University reveals that the damage to crops from climate change will be worse than anyone previously expected. Based on data gathered from experiments conducted on staple crops that were exposed to projected atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide, the team found reductions in protein levels. And so, you know, our, uh, as our carbon dioxide levels go up, the ability of plants to produce protein goes down. It's interesting in this article because they, sur they, they mention that genetically modified crops may be the best hope that we have in adapting to these rising temperatures. Don't tell anybody that. If, the case, <laughs> if that's the case, we've got to change our approach to genetically, genetically modified, modified crops. Because Monsanto isn't interested in improving the crops, they're in, interested in selling the seeds. Yes. <laughs> so, and so, so they're you, making crops that generate their own insecticide rather than well, crops they, that have more protein. They're crops that resist the insecticides that they also sell, like Roundup. Yeah. Monsanto that's, that's sells another. Roundup, which by the way is, is regarded officially as a, as a carcinogen in other parts of the world, including, I believe, the Cal state of California. I think so. I think you're but right. certainly in the EU, it's regarded as carcinogenic, and they're spraying it on the fields that have our food in the rest of the United States. And the runoff from that, the runoff from the fields in the upper mid Midwest, and over 90 percent of the, of the corn and soy crops in the United States use this or things like it, but the runoff from the farm fields winds up in the Mississippi River. And that's where people in the lower Mississippi regions get their drinking water. Yeah. Which is why the EPA is needed. Because it's so much cheaper to regulate pollution in the upper Mississippi than it is to get yeah. the pollution out of the water in the lower Mississippi that we save about $10 for the EPA about, uh, uh, f from every dollar that it costs the economy. And something similar to that on a smaller scale is happening with Lake Champlain. Yep. We have an interesting item coming up that might have something to say about well, that. Wait till it comes up. Yes. Move along. Move along. Energy Matters is the next 
item. This is still August 3rd. Bloomberg predicts strong U.S. renewable energy future. The U.S. renewable energy uh, industry is set for long-term growth as generating costs are falling and the industry becomes more resilient, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance's Head of America. He noted that problems always develop as young industries mature, but renewable energy's f uh, falling costs add to its resilience. And, you know, this, this reminds me of the, of the Energy Information Administration, which every year comes up with its projection of what's going to happen to wind and solar for the following year. And they're always off. And every year, you know, <laughs> if you plot this, the starting point of these things, you can see that the growth is, is, um, is um, uh, um, exponential. And then what they... Pr what the they line is straight. Yeah, they, they <laughs> predict this, this graph that, you know, from the, from, the readers, from the viewer's point of view, goes like this, goes like this in an exponential growth, and then it goes whoop like that. <laughs> Sorry, I was doing that backwards. It goes up exponentially and then like that. And every year, yeah. the EIA projects that 25 years from now, solar and, indus and wind industries will be at a point which is lower than what is achieved in the next 12 months. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's, it, it's become kind of a joke. Among well, according, certain people. according to this article, it says U.S. solar power, wind energy, and battery storage are here to stay. To stay. Okay, okay. the costs continue to come down. They, they do, do indeed. They do indeed. Okay, so um, our next item, still August third, is from Energy Ma Energy Matters. Do we? No, it's for the, that's, that's for the that's following the one. one. Yeah, from Energy Matters. Yeah. No. Wait a second. I got one from <laughs> Utility Dive. That's the one that has the bus. The third. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm We're guiding you astray. Yeah. We're talking about energy matters. This one is from Utility Dive. And we do have a picture, and there's the picture. By golly. Cool looking bus. Yeah, oh, it's a cool looking bus. It's supposed to be up here. No, you clicked on the wrong <laughs> click. There you there go. There we go. By Joe. By Joe. Interesting looking bus. Ah, it's supposed to have a headline here, isn't it? Yes, it is. Los Angeles issues plan to electrify its entire bus fleet. Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority announced plans to convert its entire 2,200 bus fleet to zero emission buses by 2030. It is awarding contracts for 95 uh, electric buses and charging infrastructure for two of its bus routes as Southern California Edison expands its electric vehicle charging program. And you know, this tells you something about where utilities and the fossil fuels industry that have been supplying them are going to diverge. Yeah. Because these buses no longer require fossil fuels. And so... The, the uh, electric utilities are, are working at odds with the people who are supplying them with oil and gas. That's and an interesting concept, Doesn't it? it? And then when you throw on top of that the fact that the, that the um, oil and gas and coal industries are, well, they're in trouble. Um, w there was an item in the news today that said that, uh, said that the... There, there are 40,000 40, workers in the Canadian oil fields lost their jobs last year. I can believe that because the price of oil has been cut in half. Yeah. And it's going to stay there for a while. Now, just think of what that would, ha what, what that would mean in terms of a, po a percentage of the population and apply that to the U.S. population. Yeah. And it would be like a million oil workers losing their jobs it, because... There aren't that many people in, Cal in Canada, and 40,000 of them is a fairly hefty number. Well, 40,000 a fairly would be. large oil industry, though. Yeah, they do. That's true. Okay. Um, well, I'll just mention this. They're doing this right now for two of its bus routes. Yes. They plan to do it for the rest of them. There's, there's 170 bus routes. <laughs> so it's going to be a while. Well, they said, you know, right here, 2,200 buses are going to be replaced. They're yeah. not going to do that in a weekend. Oh, no. They're planning on doing this over a 13-year over a period or a 12-year period. Well, they've got a plan to do it. Yeah, you know, they do. So uh, they're on their way. And one of the biggest reasons why they're doing this is because buses spend a lot of time idling. Yes. You know, and and if that's you, costing them money. And if you think about it, 
um, trash trucks, garbage trucks do exactly the same thing. It does Police not. Police cars. Police cars. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Get every cop a Tesla. <laughs> Okay. I don't think they'd object to that. <laughs> I have a feeling they would not, but they would want a special designed Tesla. Special police, police, police Tesla. Police Tesla, cruiser. that's right. Yeah. Okay, we're up to Friday, Friday August 4th. 4th, and we have an item from the Amherst Bulletin. Environmental scientists gather at UMass to discuss climate change and invasive species. Yeah, this is part of the bad news on climate change is that New England may become a hot spot. I have news for you guys. It already is a hot spot for invasive plants and animals. That was the pressing subject on the minds of about 200 about 100 experts from academia, conservation organizations and government agencies who gathered at a symposium on invasive species and climate change in Amherst. Well, the take home here is, the take home for the Northeast is that we're going to be some of the losers when it comes to thinking about where the hot spots are for invasive plants. Well, it's it, happening already. Invasive plants and animals and, and, animals, dis and yeah. diseases. Ticks. Ticks. You know, um, Gypsy moths. 35 years ago, 35, well, in 1990, 37 years ago, there were no cases of Lyme disease reported in Vermont. Yeah. There were no cases of babesiosis. Have you ever heard of that? The who? Babesiosis. No. Carried by the same tick. It's one of about four diseases that They're are hurting. all serious. Babesiosis mimics malaria. Well, that's not good. No, and <laughs> like malaria, it stays around. You don't get rid of it. It's chronic. So once you well, once the same you thing get with, it with Lyme disease. Yeah, once you once get you it. Once you get it, you got it. Well, with, right. with malaria, you know, you can act normal for weeks or months, and then all, yeah. of, a all of a sudden you, you have a, a new case of it. And it was, in the old days, so rare. My, my brother, who had been living in Africa for a long time, um, came back to New Jersey for a, for a uh, vacation and came down with malaria. He went to the hospital with a temperature of 105 and said, I've got malaria. And they said, no, you don't have malaria. You're in New Jersey. <laughs> well, oops. oops. And there was, there was almost no, um, there was almost no medicine for malaria in the northeastern part of the United States at the time. Well, we've got these diseases and we've got, um, Eastern equine encephalitis, and we've got, uh, um, oh, what's the other one that's mosquito-borne? West Nile virus. Yep. And we've got moose who are being killed by ticks by that ticks. are bleeding them to death because moose never lived in a place where there were ticks before. So they, so they never developed the defenses. Yeah, they don't groom themselves. And, and this is a situation that's just getting worse. So, you know, yeah, what, don't worry about it, folks. <laughs> it's a Chinese plot. It's just fake. Yeah, it is. yeah. I wish well, we had a president at, who was you a Chinese plot. Look at some plot. of the uh, the plants that we consider uh, nice. Uh, purple loosestrife is a beautiful plant, mm -hmm. but it's an invasive species and it does a job on uh, shallow water. Yes. And then there's Japanese knotweed, which I happen to like. You know, it's a pretty plant. Not only that, but, but if they you grow harvest, all over the place. If you harvest them at the right time, and you, can eat them. you can eat them, and they're yeah. really I good. Have. Yeah, I have too. Yeah, one of the things they're predicting, and this I don't want to see at all, is kudzu vine. You know, you all know, over the south. you remember Jimmy Carter uh, saying, you know, we have kudzu, kudzu in Georgia, and it, kudzu has a wonderful, beautiful flower with a wonderful fragrance. <laughs> Come on down to Georgia, we'll give you free kudzu. <laughs> Oh, I don't dear. remember that one, but I'll take you at your word. It's used as fodder for, for cattle, but, you know, it's... It's, it's everywhere down it's South horrible, Carolina. It's horrible stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay, move on? Yeah, we got okay. a picture coming up. We have a, we have a picture coming up. We are, um, we, ha we are still on Friday, August 4th. There's the picture. I'll get the, I'll get the picture. That, that ship comes from Finland, as I recall. I think it does. Uh, next, you're going to have to explain this one. Yeah. <laughs> Nexans wires Nordlink. <laughs> <laughs> Nexans Norway has started installing a subsea power cable for the 1.4 gigawatt Nordlink interconnector between Germany and Norway, starting at Folesfjord in in Vest Ogder. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
Cable ship Nexan Skagerrak is installing wires which weigh 70 kilograms per meter. So a well, chunk of this. pounds a foot. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, a chunk this long. It's going to weigh, uh, you know, uh, what's that, 262 pounds or something? 264 pounds? Well, it's more than 250. Yeah. yeah. While offshore vessel, vessel Polar King will carry out subsea burying operations, they're going to lay this cable and it's going to be buried in a yeah. trench at the bottom of the ocean and it will carry 1.4 gigawatts between Norway and Germany. So whichever one has excess power can ship some of that power to, uh, to the other. I want to look at that ship for a while. Oh, know. okay. I worked for a company that made undersea cable. Yeah. And I had been on a uh, cable weighing ship. Yeah. And boy, have they changed. Oh, yeah. I mean, this was, basically it was designed for ocean. Yeah. And it had nothing on it but 24 foot reels. <laughs> of cable, yeah, you know, and and the ability to splice on board, yes, and they just laid this cable across across the ocean. Yeah, my brother worked on a cable. I think it was a cable laying ship that belonged to the navy. They had some, yeah. Yeah, and his uh, ca the cable laying apparatus was on on the ship was considered secret. Now, this is a long, I mean, this is 50 years, more than 50 years ago. Well, back in those and, days, the cables were mostly telephone and telegraph. Yeah. They weren't power cables. Yeah, and, and it was so secret that the whole thing was completely covered whenever they went into any port, regardless of where that. it was. Yeah, I can believe that. And he came, went into a, into a v town in New Jersey where there was an AT&T installation and saw the prototype <laughs> for that system just sitting on a hilltop. <laughs> next to a highway that people drove by. <laughs> he was absolutely appalled, uh, but that happens. Okay, should we move on? Yeah, let's move on. Okay, bit. we Here's are up to an article f on uh, from the Eagle Tribune. Massachusetts to weigh plans for green power. There you go. Green energy companies have submitted dozens of bids to bring more hydropower, wind, and solar power to Massachusetts to help keep the lights turned on and cut em carbon emissions. In total, at least 46 bids were submitted to the State Department of Energy Resources by last week's deadline. Winning bids are set to be announced in January, and these things are coming from every direction. You know, you've well, got... The, the backstory here is that uh, Massachusetts is facing an energy crunch. Yes. Because they've closed coal plants. Yes. They've closed nuclear plants, and they, they've got to fill it in. They've got to get some... Right. So this is a very ambitious program, and it's been started already. Yes. I mean, they, they, they're starting to put wind turbines out in the sea near Cape, near Cape Cod, near right. Martha's Vineyard. Right, and that's one of the, one of the big bids is coming from a, an undeveloped uh, wind uh, site off, off of Cape Cod. Yeah. But we've got bids bringing down... Cables from Maine, where they where they're bringing down wind power from Maine. Um, there's a lot of them coming through New Hampshire, coming through Maine, coming through New York, coming through Vermont. Yeah, and there's one the one of the ones coming down from Maine is actually not coming on land. It's it's coming down over the sea. All for all uh, for under the, the sea. sea. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, um, and of course we've I've been seeing news about this um, ever since this uh, the 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 bidding closed. And because Vermont is supporting um, is supporting a, a route that goes through Vermont, the uh, one that goes under the Lake Champlain, we've talked right. about that. Yes, one. we have indeed. And actually, it it would produce almost no change in terms of the Vermont countryside because it's either under Lake Champlain or it or follows under a highway, or it follows existing yeah. routes. So and the one in New York, the one that's going under Hudson, where yeah. it's on land, it's on railroad tracks. <laughs> or under railroad tracks. Under track. railroad tracks. You know, okay, I don't have a problem with that. I don't either. It's a better I, way to distribute power technically. I don't know why they didn't do that many years ago. Uh, cost. Really? It co upfront cost is more. Okay. Long-term costs are lower. And, and, and the, the um, um, reliability is, is higher. Reliability is much higher. That's one of the reasons you know, Germany... Clowns shooting at, at insulators. Yeah, well, you also don't have season. big ice storms. If, you, ice, yeah. if you think about, I forget which one of the uh, outages we had, but there was a huge outage that covered the entire northeastern uh, part of the United States, and it happened because um, 
at, at when when um, high voltage lines, I think it was in Ohio, got hot, they expanded. They sagged. They sagged. Yeah, I One remember One of them that. hit a tree, yep. and that brown brought down the whole Northeast power system. Yeah, it did. It's pretty vulnerable. Yeah. Okay. We are up to Saturday, oh, Aug sure. August 5th. We have a picture here. This picture is kind of unbelievable. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Explain to us what we're looking well, at. Well, let's let's start by by getting the the title. Retreating Exit Glacier has become an icon of climate change. Exit Glacier, that is the name of the That's glacier. That's the name of the glacier. A finger of ice spilling out of the Chugach Mountains marks Alaska's rapidly warming climate, almost literally. The path approaching Exit Glacier, the most accessible of the 500 square miles of ancient ice covering the uh, Kenai Fjords National Park, is a timeline of retreat. The glacier lost 252 feet last summer, yep. just just in one summer, yep, yep. <clears throat> visitors t are noticing the change. And, and the by, picture there is uh, where it was a hundred years ago. Yeah, and just think about this: that was rocks and ice a hundred years ago. Now it's forest. That means that as the glacier retreated, um, soil was deposited, probably mostly by wind. Yeah. And little bits of soil. I'm sure there was soil there to begin with. Well, there, I don't know, soil under a glacier. Soil in glaciers. Yeah, that's know? true. But, but you wind up, I hadn't thought of that, but you wind up having small plants like lichens and things like that growing anyway. Uh -huh. And they will grow directly on rocks. And as, as, as that sort of thing happens, the, the, you have the decomposition of the vegetation, mosses and things like that, and that have gradually build soil gradually that is thick enough to support a tree. And what have we got here? Trees. Where the glacier ended, that sign, why don't you put the picture up, Tom? Yeah, that, put the picture back up. That sign um, in, the, in the lower right quadrant of the screen um, that says 1917 is where the glacier ended well, in, in 1917. 1917. Well, it, this is an interesting article, especially mm -hmm. if you like glaciers. Yeah. A lot of nice pictures. Yeah. There. Uh, it shows, one of the pictures is a map, Yeah. and it shows where this glacier has been mm -hmm. over the years. Yes. You know, and it's, it's really scary. Yeah, and uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of a couple of things that happened when I was in, in grade school and middle school. There were, there was a, a, the first time I heard about climate change was a, um, a, uh, an anecdotal thing that I heard from a teacher who had grown up very near the Canadian border in Minnesota or North Dakota, um, who had been told winters aren't as, as, as they aren't the same as they used to be. This is, this guy this had been told, then, huh? yeah, wow. in like 1955, the winters weren't what they used to be. There was not as much snow. Yeah. They were not as cold. Yeah. And a year or two after that, we were in school and a little girl was upset because she learned that the glaciers were all retreating in Glacier Park. And the teacher said... to change the name soon. Yeah. And the teacher said, oh, you don't have to worry about that. They're retreating very slowly and we don't know why. Well, just to They're give... Almost gone. Just for the record, so that people understand, the first scientist to predict climate change as a result of carbon emissions was uh, did it in pr in in a paper that was published in 1896. Wow! The first president of the United States to be approached by scientists who said, "We, you know, Mr. President, we've got a problem," was Lyndon Johnson, and he was told that more than 50 years ago. Yep, I've read and, that. Yeah, and of course Exxon. Um, had its climate scientists de uh, uh, determined by 1979 or 1980 that they had a problem, and they they hired science to scientists to assess the possibility of that problem sometime earlier. So they were aware of it, probably when when Lyndon Johnson was, and in in 1966. And in 1967, Lyndon Johnson's White House approached the utilities and said to them, we've got a problem. And here we are in 2017, and, and we've we got a president of the United States who says, what, me worry? Yeah, right. Interesting takeaway from this article. A little bit cynical. 
Future park visitors may not be able to get a close view of the glaciers, but they will at least have a safe perch to see where the glacier used to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, safe unless the wildlife comes and disturbs them. Yeah, right. And they probably have brown bears up there. I would not want to get into an argument with one of them. And by the way, in the Kenai Peninsula, this is, a, this is only a small amount yes. of the glaciers on that. There's yeah. a lot of glaciers. Yes. Yep. Okay, Let's should we press on? on? Yeah. We have an item from the Independent. Okay. We've got a, got a picture here. Nope, not this one. Worldwide temperature trends? No, that's the next one. That's the next right one. On. Okay. This is from the Independent. Trump promises about coal industry comeback will be tough to keep. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't believe this guy. President Donald Trump came to the heart of coal country and told a large and cheering crowd what they wanted to hear that Obama's war on coal had, has ended. But in fact, Ka Kentucky coal jobs and production continued down in the second quarter of the year. In eastern Kentucky, employment in, in the second quarter dropped by 5.3%. That is not an insignificant drop. Not at all. Not at, as a matter of fact, it's quite scary there. It they is. see what's going on. And it's not environmental. It's because of competition. Well, lack of demand for coal. Yeah and competition from the West. Well, there was another article that came up, you know, the, about the Westinghouse bankruptcy and the V.C. Summers plant closing yeah, down yeah. and so forth. And it, it just came up saying part of the reason why that plant was canceled was because of, of overruns. But part of the reason was that in 2008, when the can plant was ordered, mm -hmm. they thought that the electric uh, demand in the United States would, would continue to rise. But it didn't. But it didn't. It, yeah. it declined. Yeah. So there's no market for the electricity they're going to be producing. And that, of course, has, is the coal industry and ultimately the gas industry are going to be hard-pressed because the market is declining. Well, an interesting coincidence, if you will, in eastern Kentucky. Yeah. The power power for that area is generated by the big sandy power plant. Yes. Okay, which just switched from coal to natural gas. Yes. <laughs> what can you say? Uh, okay, we are up to an item that came yeah, on a a August 5th on. from the Weather Channel, and this also is a bit scary. Here. Let's, see Let's put see. it up. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> here we go We're professionals here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what do we got this for a title? This is a scary picture. Yeah, it's a scary picture when you know what it means. Why one spot in the Atlantic is resisting global warming. Yeah. And if you see it out there on the map, you can see that white spot that there. It, below, Why is it white? Yeah, below Greenland and east of uh, New England and, and Newfoundland and so forth. Um, the, the North Atlantic Ocean is home to a warming hole that has enthralled scientists. But a new study on, the, uh, on it in the journal Nature Climate Change is troubling. The study is a part of a growing chorus of research that suggests the cold patch shows a major ocean current system may be slowing down and melting Arctic sea ice could be the culprit. Well, this just downplays what's going on. It says it's a major ocean current system. They don't mention it's the Gulf Stream. Yeah, and the Gulf Stream is the only reason why um, uh, why places you can like live in England in yeah, the winter time. That's right, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, uh, Ireland yeah, yeah. and even even you know, I mean, look at that map. They're on the same uh, latitude as the southernmost end of Alaska. I'm put the map again. They are absolutely. That's and, exactly right. And the thing that makes them different from the their environment, different from Alaska, is, is that Gulf Stream. That Gulf Stream. And you know, I've lived in England, and you've spent time in Ireland. In Southern Ireland, there are palm trees. There are palm trees <laughs> where I lived in England. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, if you went down by the coast, there were scorpions down there. Now, the, the scorpions were an invasive species, but the palm mm -hmm. trees were not. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but they, you know, they, they're there all the time. And uh, one person told me, you have half, a, half an inch of snow, and it closes the whole landscape down because nobody knows how to drive yeah. in it. Half an inch. Okay. Well, what's happening here is this Gulf Stream seems to be slowing down. Yeah, and as it slows down, that it, it, the weather it threatens. It cools off northern Europe. Yeah, and the weather threatens to change dramatically 
and it could have profound effects on places like France and Spain, in addition to England and, and Ireland, Italy, Greece, all of those places could start feeling more like uh, Wyoming or... Well, certainly the, the Iberian Peninsula is going to feel it. Oh, no doubt. I mean, sunny Spain, you know, it's a sunny nice Spain. warm country. It's sunny not Rome, be. sunny Italy. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it can get cold in places like Israel. Well, why? Well, look at that. Israel is about the same latitude as North Carolina. It can get cold in North Carolina. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, let's move on. We're up to Sunday, August 6th. Flash drought in U.S. High Plains may have already destroyed half of this year's wheat crop. Yeah, are you ready for a higher price of bread? Clean Technica, the flash drought that came out of nowhere this summer in the U.S. High Plains, afflicting Montana and the Dakota's worst, has already destroyed more than half of this year's wheat crop going by some recent field studies. Flash droughts are expected to become more common over coming decades as climate continues to warm. Well, this flash drought is worst, worst in the Dakotas. Yeah. But it's covering the entire U.S. West. Yeah. Totally the West half, U.S., Canada, and Mexico. It's yes. Warm. Well, you can see from the map. I'll try to get it up again. You can see from that map. That's That red area, is, uh, those red areas, are the ones that have warmed the most. And we're talking about areas of southern Canada and the, the upper Midwest, along with places it's like... The Northeast is being warmer. Yeah. Although we're not experiencing that, not right now. And actually, the the models for climate change suggest that New England will remain um, cooler than it had been in the that's summer. What we, that's what they've been talking about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Move on. Well, let's see. Is there anything else? Yeah. There's, they're mentioning what 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 the article doesn't mention a lot of is uh, wildfires. Yes. That's as big of a problem. Oh, we just had as one of those week. come up today too. We'll Did see. We? We'll talk about this oh, next week. In, yeah. In the yeah. Okay. Um, there is there is concern because of the the extremely high number of wildfires, believe it or not, in Greenland. Wow. Yeah. I didn't think they had enough green to burn. Well, they do, and the wildfires produce soot, and the soot lands on the snow, and the snow melts in the sun. Vicious circle, isn't yeah, it? Isn't yeah, isn't it? Okay, well, should we move, move on? I've got an, another image coming up. Yeah, this is a nice, nice I like picture. This. Yeah, this yeah. is nice. This, this is, is the Ohio River. Yes, and this uh, is from the Review. Hydroelectric plant sought at the Pike Island Dam, which is near Wheeling, West Virginia. Okay. It's, it's where Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania come together. Smack, in, Virginia, smack right? into each other. Huh? Smack into Smack it. Yep. Yeah. Citing Appalachia's need to uh, compensate for losing thousands of megawatts worth of coal-fired power in the last few years, developer Pike Island Energy hopes to build a, a $200 million hydroelectric plant at Pike Island Locks and Dam in the Ohio River. The 48 megawatt plant would generate enough elect electricity for about 22,000 homes. They're not going to be raising that dam. No, uh, if you look at the side on the left where there's trees, yes, it's going to be over there because they're not going to interfere with the locks on the other side. Right. And I would expect they're going to build a sluice way. Yes. There's a road back there. You can't really see it. You barely see it in the picture. Yes. They're going to build a sluice way, and down at the end of that, they're going to have a big yeah. generating station. Yeah. That, it's not very big, by the way. It's only 48 megawatts. Which is not all that big, but the... the but they it, can use it. Yeah, and, and this... Um, and it's free energy. And, on top of everything else, it's not going to have much environmental impact at all, aside from the, the fact... The dam's there already. Yeah, aside from the fact that that um, it's going to be generating power and reducing reliance on fossil fuels. The fish are already going over this dam in both directions. They're going to continue going over yeah, it in both directions. Yeah, that's all been taken care of long since. Yeah, long since. But it's interesting to see that happening. Okay. Well, they will be doing this, you can be sure, at all of these dams. Yeah. And there's a lot of them because yeah. it's, the, it's, it's barges. Right. Barges go well downriver. They don't go well upriver. Yes. <laughs> So they have these 
how would you call them? They're locks, but they just elevate the barges so that they can yeah. go upstream. In so effect. they can go upstream. And this is something that happens all over the world. In fact, we had a story about Queen Elizabeth's um, uh, um, Archimedes turbines yeah. in, the, in one of our shows a couple yeah, of years absolutely. ago where there's uh, Archimedes turbines being in use on, the, on a, on a um, weir, which is a dam except the water goes over the top in such a way that the fish can literally swim over it. And um, that is supplying power to Windsor Castle, which is huge. <laughs> okay, speaking of, of the, uh, the uh, UK, we have an item coming up from the Times, which is, I don't know what Times this is, so... I can't tell you. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure which time it is. Times it is either. Yeah. Islanders set sail on pollution-free ferries project. This is really interesting because it shows you how important uh, a, a a a research and and development program can be um, undertaken by just a group of local people. That's that's exactly what's happening here. Yeah. It's a the, small island. Yeah, the tiny Orkney island of Ide is working on an initiative that would could revolutionize the world of sea transport. With shipping under pressure for producing high levels of emissions, islanders are developing a project that could pave the way for pollution-free, roll-on, roll-off vehicle ferries powered by locally produced hydrogen. Well, you can't get to these islands without a ferry. Yeah. So this is very important to the yeah. commerce. You know, I just had a thought. But go ahead, Tom. Well, I was just saying, it's a small island. They're doing this themselves. They, they've got a windmill. They've got tidal power. And they're generating hydrogen. The day will come, you mark my words, within 15 years, when electric vehicles are so widespread and the charging stations are so numerous that there will be ferries operating whose source of energy is from the electric vehicle batteries that are on them. <laughs> I, wouldn't argue, I, I wouldn't argue against that. Yeah. It would take a little bit of doing, but it Just a little bit. When I, when I was in, at, in college, I had a roommate who came from a, an island in, in Casco Bay. And, um, you know, the only way you could get to the island was on a ferry. And the ferry ran back and forth a couple of times a day. Yeah. And, you know, you could probably run a ferry like that using the combined resources of a half a dozen cars. You probably could. Okay, we are up to Monday, August 7th. Oh, yes. Got we have a picture here of, and I think this picture is fake. <laughs> <laughs> That's rice, I think, huh? It, it is rice, rice, but go ahead, Tom. Could perennial crops be an answer to, to climate change? This is from NewsX at China's Yunnan Agriculture University. Researchers developed a perennial rice by crossing or Oriza savita, sativa, I'm sorry, the short-lived Asian rice, with a wild African perennial, Oriza longestamina, longestaminata. The cross, a possible help for climate change, quote, apparently lasts for at least five years and gives 10 seasons of grain twice a year with re... re, re, re woo, yields comparable to seasonal rice. In other words, they're giving two, two yields a year, each about equal to what a traditional rice crop would give. And they're, do, they're doing that for a period of 10 years, uh, five years, five years on a single they're getting, planting. They're getting 10, ten crops, crops out of, out of one, one planting. planting. Yep. That's important. And you it know, is. the thing they that I was thing. saying about this picture, yeah, I, think, I think that what they did was they sneaked us a picture of ordinary rice and said, that's perennial. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know the difference. Neither would I. <laughs> Maybe they're, they're absolutely scrupulous, but who knows. Our next item comes from Gears of Biz. Gears of biz. Gears of biz. Can we? This is a long and interesting article. It is. It really is. There's a lot it of hate is. in this article. Yes. Can we put coal miners back to work in clean energy? It's not as easy as it sounds. Not at all. On the other hand, when you look at the numbers, it's impressive. There are a few more than 50,000 coal miners working in the United States. That is slightly more 
than, than last year with Don, President Donald Trump taking credit for the change, which was arranged by Barack Obama. But coal mining is not secure work. By contrast, the wind industry added 15,000 workers last year and the solar industry added 50,000. So the solar industry last year actually added more jobs than the coal mines higher altogether. Okay. And, you know, the question that the, that the author of the uh, article is asking is, can we get those co miners out of the mines and well, working on, on solar? I'm sure being miners, they're qualified. Oh, yeah. You know, they're, oh, they're, yeah. They're, they're, it's, <laughs> it's a tough job. It's a technical job. They know what they're doing. They, yeah. But the first challenge here is geographic. Yes. The solar jobs are not where the miners are. Yes. And a lot of my family connections, they don't want to move. They don't want to move. Yeah. That's so right. We talked about that yeah. a week or two ago when we were, when we were talking the about The solar and wind jobs pop up where the sunshine and wind are considered. Of course, that does happen in Kentucky. Okay. We have Malta Independent Online providing us with the next, here, next item. And this picture is um, another interesting one, but I want to comment on it just briefly because I think anybody who's whose color vision is like my own, would have difficulty seeing the middle of those three lines. One of them goes from Tunisia to Malta, which is south of, uh, south of uh, Sicily. That's, that's, that's the white one. The white one, right. The one on the left, which is yellow, goes from Tunisia to France. It's about Marseille. About Marseille. The, the one in the middle is red. And it goes it, about Naples, it? It, yeah, or, or Rome, and it it it's hard for me to see that against the green and blue backgrounds. Okay. Other people might find it easier, but I find it hard to see. So, what do you got for a title? Firm plans undersea cable to bring Tunisian solar energy to Malta. Tunor Limited, a private company incorporated in the United Kingdom, is seeking to set up a 4.5 gigawatt concentrating solar power system in Tunisia. That's a large system. Well, the article says it's about the size of Malta itself. Yes. It is huge. It's huge. Malta, huge. <laughs> Malta is not huge, but this system is the same size and it is huge. Well, it's four and a half gigawatts. It's a lot of gigawatts. It's a lot of gigawatts. The power could be sent through three submarine cables to Europe. The first link, sending up uh, 500 megawatts of electricity through Malta, could be finished as soon as 2020. <coughs> That's, That's huge. That's the short one. Yep. That's the short one. It's also the small one. Well, the, okay. white, the white line's already there. Yes. So the, it's just a dotted line. <coughs> yeah, all they have to do is send it to Malta, which is a f fairly short route compared to the others. Okay, we're up. Behind all is DC, yep. whatever that's worth. Yep. And it's got enough to power over 5 million European households. Wow. Okay. Uh, fuel uh, over 7 million <laughs> electric vehicles. Yes. That's okay. 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 <laughs> we're up to Tuesday, August 8th, and we have an item from the New York Times. Uh-huh. Let me get you up there. And believe me, well, go ahead, Tom. <laughs> Scientists fear Trump will dismiss a blunt climate report. The, excuse me. The average temperature in the United States has risen rapidly and drastically since 1980, and Americans are feeling the effects according to a sweeping federal climate change report awaiting approval by the Trump administration. Scientists say they fear that the administration could change or suppress the report, and, and they leaked a draft. To the New York Times, yep. which so you can get it if you follow your article, yeah, and pick up the New York Times. That's right. And it is a link in the New York Times this is, article. This is um, Tuesday, August eighth. I will warn anybody who wants to see this report. I, I when I put this up at the blog, I yeah. got an email from a friend of mine who lives in New Mexico saying, "George, this is fascinating. Could you send me a copy of the report?" <laughs> The report is 500 and it's more than 550 pages long. I just saw the first page. Yeah. I didn't go any further than you, that. You cannot download. They've, they've got a, it's, it's kind of like a paywall, but it isn't. You, you can only download three pages of it. You can, it's too big. 
Well, you can go to whatever page you want and download three pages. And you could do that over and over and over again. Okay, they but you can't <laughs> they and you can't download it. You can't you can only print three pages, but it's 550 pages long. The executive summary is long and you just have to scroll through it and read it. And I I started reading the executive summary. I didn't finish. Yeah. But this is a this is a big report. And it says, we have a problem. We have a problem now. It is costing people money now. It is costing people health now. It is destroying the economy now. It is destroying the environment now. And we have to do something about it now. And they're saying, the scientists were saying, they're afraid the Trump, uh, Trump uh, administration is just going to say, but it's a Chinese hoax. Why should we do anything about That's that? That's what looks like it's going to happen. Well. Those, this was from the article. Those who challenge scientific data on human-caused climate change are worried that the draft report will be publicly really released. Yeah. They're scared. Well, you know the thing that I'm scared of is what's going to happen one way or the other because this report is almost unquestionably correct. I've seen this stuff well, it's myself. Been leaked, so a lot of people can see it. Yeah. And you know, the people who have the... <laughs> The, patience. The patience to yeah. see the 500 pages are going to yeah. be aware of it. Well, our next item, if, if should we move on? Yeah, we can. Our next item is from the BBC News, and we have a picture here. This is, nice this is not Neuschwanstein, <laughs> the, the mad king, what's his name's, um, fairy tale castle in Bavaria. This is um, Jungfrau Joch, which is in uh, Switzerland. And that's uh, not a castle on top of no, it. No, it's an observatory. It's an observatory. Yeah. Dodgy greenhouse gas data threatens Paris Accord. Yep. Po this is an interesting article. It is an interesting article, and it's, it leaves you wondering, what do we know about what's going on here? Potent climate warming gases are being emitted into the atmosphere, but are not being recorded in official inventories, a BBC investigation has found. In just one example, Swiss air monitors detected large quantities of one gas coming from a location in Italy. However, the Italian submission to the UN records, uh, I'm sorry, uh, to, submission to the UN records just a tiny amount of the gas. Well, they mention that gas, and it's used in re refrigeration. Yeah. It's 15,000 times war more warming than CO2. Yep. And a lot of these things that are used in refrigeration really don't de decompose very fast. Well. So it's a problem. And the, the, prob the problem, what they're talking about here is the data sucks. Yeah. The data that they're dealing with is inaccurate. Well, they, they, said, that, they said that the data from China, for example, is, is accurate plus or minus 100%. <laughs> How well, could you be minus 100 <laughs> By emitting nothing and reporting that you're emitting something. Wow. You know? But that's, not, that's clearly not what they're doing. So th well, the statement... The China, it says there is no Chinese inventory for these gases because they're banned. Yeah. But they're using them anyhow. Yeah. Well, what can you say? We have these people... These flaws pose a bigger threat to the Paris Climate Agreement than Trump's intention to withdraw. Well, Trump's intention to withdraw is total folly. And at some point, people are going to realize that they're being had. And that point is coming soon. And I don't know how soon. It might be this year. It might be next year. Yep. But it's when it happens, inevitable. things are going to change. It is inevitable. Um, you know, you, you can only deny reality for, for so long before it catches up with you. And that's what the United States is officially doing. Anyway, well, we've got another one coming up here. From the urban developer. I wish I had a picture of it because it's interesting. It's, it is interesting. I, I had too many pictures, so I didn't it's, include uh, it. Well, for those who are interested, pull this thing up because there's a lot of pictures of a very unusual <laughs> and decorative tower. It was yeah, kind of fun. I thought it was kind of ugly. Germany <laughs> builds revolutionary water tank for energy storage. A German public works department, Stadtwerke Heidelberg, has broken ground on a new type of energy storage center. This solar and wind, wind energy generated on the site will be used to heat up the water inside the tower. The heat will then be sold. The heat storage center will also provide a, sub, a sustainable energy knowledge hub to the community. And this thing looked like a, what, what would you say, a kind of a blue can that had was not quite cylindrical and had a 
funny looking helical <laughs> ramp running around. There's a nice it. ramp on the outside yeah. to climb up. That in. you could walk up, which did and not look like it appealed to me. There's two elevators. Oh, and good. There's, uh, ah, I feel better. There's spaces of bistro and terraces up the top. Up so. at the top, yeah. So and it's, it's, it's kind of a light time. blue color and, you know, <laughs> what can I say? If you like light As blue, towers go. It's an improvement. Yeah. If you like light blue hair on people <laughs> yelling, <laughs> you might like this. Okay, we're up to Wednesday, August 9th. And we're starting off here with an image, I think. We do. Yes. So this is um, a storage proje a project project like reported in Renews. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> Saxony angle and uh, Saxony angle for but I can't even say this. Saxony Angle for Belectric Battery. Yeah. Belectric is the name of the company. Belectric is the name of the company. Belectric has built and commissioned a 16 megawatt hour battery storage plant for Ein's uh, Energy in Saxony. The 10 million euro, which is $11.7 million project, provides primary reserve of 10 megawatts to the power market, Belectric said. The German state of Saxony funded the project together with 1 million euros from the European Regional Development Fund. This is pretty sophisticated. Yeah, it, it is. It responds to frequency changes within split seconds. Yep. It either stores electricity from the grid or feeds energy into the grid. And it will so switch. this is stabilizing the yeah, grid. This is <laughs> producing a far more stable grid than we've ever had before. This is true. And I'm kind of amazed that it's doing this, you yes. know, but uh, they've developed the technology. Well, I actually wrote an email to the people at Belectric and said, what's this price? Because the, the pr it didn't say it cost 10 million euros. It, it, it had a slightly different way of wording that. Oh, you, you I, I, I actually that. Tra tracked down the, I actually tracked down the press release from Belectric and I tracked down the people who did it, and I wrote an email to them, and I got a response this morning. Did you? Yeah, and it said, yeah, the, the 10 million euros was the total cost of the whole thing. The whole thing, this was everything. This was not just the batteries, it was the whole thing. So. Well, it sounds, sounds pretty good. And well, you had said it was sophisticated. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to find out what was yeah, going on there. Take a quick interest, look at that. Thing. Interested in batteries. Yeah, it does, I guess those you're, things what in the you're front. What you're looking at is those vertical things are the batteries themselves. Yeah. And those things in the front that look like washing machines are the uh, controls. Well, oh, I thought they were the washing machines. <laughs> <laughs> if you look closely, those are fans. Yes, I can see that. Yeah. And there's I, a couple of guys sitting in that picture. Well, maybe so they're dryers. That's are. why they'd have fans. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So um, now we have an item from the Huff Post. And this is disturbing. Okay, let's uh, get rid of that picture there. Get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're still there, but you're not, you're uh, not front, and, front and center. Yeah. Cable tells U.S. diplomats to sidestep questions on re-engaging near the Paris climate deal. Fake yeah. news? Fake news. <laughs> U.S. diplomats, there's more to the more to it is the part that b bothers me. U.S. diplomats should sidestep questions on what it would take for the Trump administration to re-engage in the global Paris climate agreement, a diplomatic cable seen by Reuters said. The cable was sent to embassies by Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. It also said diplomats should make clear the U.S. wants to help other countries use fossil fuels. Is that a little bit of a diversion or what? Well, do you think maybe he's, uh, he's uh, aiding his friends? He used to be the CEO of Exxon. Could be. You know, yeah, and, and I, I'm sorry, this, this is not in the interest of the people of this country. It's not in the interest of anybody else either, except for the people who sell the fossil fuels. Well, this is, this is all deception. This is from the <coughs> yeah. If asked, for example, <coughs> quote, what is the process for consideration of re-engagement in the Paris Agreement? The answer should be fake. And then they give you a couple of answers, you, you can, <laughs> which aren't saying anything at all. You know, and this, another thing that's interesting about this, um, Tad Montgomery and I met with a couple of people in the town here to talk about uh, yeah. various things that had to do. Well, you saw the Energy Committee had, mm -hmm. and, and um, 
we we met with people and, and talked about about uh, various things regarding energy and so forth in Brattleboro. But one of the things that was mentioned was the American withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement. And we and what should the we should withdrew? The yeah, we withdrew from an agreement that was an agreement in principle with, that had no specific teeth. We had not. We, we we had no nothing to lose by by failing to meet the goals. Neither does anybody else. Mm -hmm. We had nothing to lose by being in the agreement. So why did we withdraw? Because Donald Trump said it was a bad deal for America. It was well, a bad. It wasn't any deal at all. <laughs> it wasn't a deal. It, this, this whole yeah. thing is pure hot air. Yeah, it is. It's it's hot air. Well, we're <laughs> maybe that we're in the middle of this hot air, and it could be kind of scary. Yeah, well, th there are things that are going on that are that are scary. They're not now, the kind of stuff we talk about on this program, but they're scary. This is Huff Post, by the way, has given us that. Now, our next item comes from Domain B, okay, and we, we do have, have a picture, picture here. And here. this is kind of a fascinating, uh, fascinating development for me. It's again batteries, just like we saw, but a little, little different. A little kind. different kind of battery. It's not really a battery at all. It's but go ahead, read Fuel the made from solar power and the air's carbon dioxide. No, it's not really a battery technically, but it is storage. It is storage. In erratic. What, 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 in erratic. What, what, what person would come together with a, with a company that is in erratic? <laughs> I, I, you know, it's mind boggling. Anyway, this is a spin off of the Karlsruhe. Institute of Technology and has cooperated with Finnish partners to develop a mobile chemical pilot plant that can be used decentrally. It's an interesting word, you know, my spell Put checker. It anywhere. My spell checker came up and said, <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> to produce gasoline, diesel oil, and kerosene from renewable hydrogen and carbon dioxide from the air. The pilot plant is so compact that it fits into a shipping container. They, they started making gasoline in this thing. Well, it's interesting what they're doing there. They're taking water. Yeah. They're taking electricity from a solar array. Yep. They, they're they're not using electrolysis like we did in high school. They're using a, a reverse fuel cell. Yes. Which I can't even understand. Well, a re reverse fuel cell works exactly the same way they, a regular one does. But backwards. But backwards. Yeah. So the, so they're putting in water, mm -hmm. and it's producing. Hydrogen and oxygen. Mm -hmm. They're releasing the oxygen to the air. Yeah. They're using the hydrogen to make methane. Yes. And once you got methane, you, you can, can make almost whatever anything. you want it. Yeah. Well, plastic, gasoline, yeah. diesel fuel. Yeah. And there are scientists who say we have gone so far down the the carbon emissions path that we have to get proactive about removing carbon dioxide from the air. Well, this is one way they can do it. But it's going to have to. It's going to take a lot more of these guys. Oh yeah, and another thing <laughs> like too. A million of them. Yeah, but we're not going to be doing this to make gasoline, diesel oil, and kerosene because then all you're doing is perpetuating the pollution that we've already got. In other words, yeah. you're you're you're, you're right. breaking the you're, you're right. breaking the carbon cycle, but you're still emitting particulates of carbon and things like that that are going to, that that kill people. So the proper thing to do here. I know this is going to sound weird, but from my point of view. If you want to use something like that, I'm all for it. But what you should be doing, and here's where people are going to say, what? You should be using this to make plastic. I'm just thinking the same thing. And it should be used for purposes that cannot wind up in the oceans and will maybe by law go to landfills because you want to sequester that carbon. You don't want to reuse it. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Now, where do you take this stuff for landfills? It doesn't have to go into a landfill. You know, in, in, in communities that I lived in, they had landfills that were, in some cases, not much bigger than a house, and people would throw their junk in. Yeah. You know, and in some landfills, as these things, the little ones closed down, the, the, the bigger landfills started getting f filled. I used to live in Winchester, New Hampshire, and there was a landfill there that was a couple hundred yards across. And um, it was an interesting place to go to if you didn't mind the smell. And the the um, but these landfills are getting those are getting filled up. But what we do have all over the country is things like strip mines, which are big holes in the ground. Yep. 
other mines that are big holes in the ground. Yeah, yeah refill those things. Just fill them with plastic. Well, you remember last week we talked about the CSX Railroad? Yes. One of the biggest things they haul is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> They have hundred car long trains of garbage. Yes. Well, it's really landfill stuff. It's really yeah. it's not garbage garbage, it's trash. Yeah. I we used to make a distinction that a lot of people don't make anymore between garbage and trash. Yeah. But um so <laughs> we'll we see you that later, right. everybody. <laughs> Adios. Have a nice week. Still.